Hey there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Today, Primate Labs launched a new version of Geekbench, that's Geekbench 6. It's available for Android, iOS, Mac, Linux, and for Windows. And running up to this announcement, I had a chance to chat to John Poole, who is the CEO and founder of Primate Labs. In fact, he wrote the original version of Geekbench. We get into all of this uh, in the interview. Now, this is a cut down version of an interview that is also available on the Authority Media YouTube channel. And I'll leave a link to the full interview in the description below. OK, let's dive straight in. Hello, John. Nice to speak to you this evening or this morning, wherever it is that you are. Yeah, uh, it's afternoon here in Toronto. Uh, good to meet you and uh, good to speak with you. Now, benchmarking can be quite a controversial uh, topic, and I'd like to talk about that uh, with you today. But before we dive into that, please do tell us a little bit about yourself and about Geekbench. Sure. So uh, Geekbench, uh, it's a product that we make here at Primate Labs. I'm the founder. Uh, I'm also sort of the the uh, the spokesperson, if you will, for the company. Uh, so I get to do all these sort of fun interviews like this and talk about Geekbench. Uh, so that's that's my role here at Primate Labs. So as the founder of uh, Geekbench, uh, how, how did you come up with the idea? What happened? What was the itch that you needed to scratch? Yeah, so it was actually back around 2003. Um, I went out and uh, I just switched over to Mac uh, from PC uh, maybe about a year before, you know, I had a G4 system. Apple came out with a G5. It was very exciting, you know, the first 64-bit personal computer and all of that. And I went out and I bought one uh, and got it home and started running, you know, the sort of tests I use, uh, you know, developer stuff, uh, you know, my usual sort of things that I do on my computer. And it didn't feel that much faster. Uh, so I was a little bit confused. Uh, so I went and, you know, uh, downloaded some of the popular Mac benchmarks at the time just to see sort of, you know, is this a problem with my system? Uh, you know, what's going on? Just trying to figure out what was happening. And the benchmarks were saying things like, oh, no, the G5 is faster. It's your, your G5 is working properly. Like, you know, it's on par with all the other G5s out there. Um, and I thought, well, this is really strange. So I went in and I reverse engineered one of the one of the popular benchmarks at the time and found that the tests were very, very small and synthetic. They, they're sort of doing, you know, incredibly simplistic tasks that really, you know, uh, weren't good measures of performance. Like they were so small and so trivial that, you know, uh, really just depended on how fast your uh, processor ran uh, and nothing else didn't take into account memory or caches or anything like that. So I thought, you know, oh, how hard can it be? I'll write some of my own tests and we'll see what happens. And this was a side project I kind of worked on on and off for about three years until about, you know, early 2006. Uh, the first version was sort of ready to release. You know, I went and gathered some data uh, about, you know, how different processors performed. You know, it was available on uh, Mac because that's obviously what sort of kicked this off with the G5. But I also still had a PC around for gaming and whatnot. So, you know, I thought, oh, it would be interesting to do these cross-platform comparisons. And though it, so in 2006, released the first version of Geekbench sort of as, you know, this free download that people could use. You know, we published a couple of articles just saying, oh, like, you know, here's some charts and whatnot, some graphs showing, you know, P4 performance versus G5 versus G4 performance. And that side project just sort of grew into, you know, the business that it is today where, you know, we're providing benchmarks for millions of users each month and, uh, you know, kind of sort of, you know, for cross-platform comparisons, we're sort of the go-to benchmark now. Now, you said those initial benchmarks that you're using were small and synthetic and they weren't really giving you uh, accurate results. Now, I noticed that uh, Geekbench uses lots and lots of different algorithms because I'm, it's important to be able to simulate real-life workloads. Do you want to tell us a bit about the different workloads that Geekbench runs? Yeah, sure. So uh, in Geekbench 6, we've got uh, 15 uh, separate workloads that we use to measure CPU performance. Um, and we've tried to pick a variety of different tasks that reflect, we think at least, what people use their computers for day in, day out, or what they use their smartphones for day in or day out. Um, you know, compression is important because, you know, uh, doing things like, you know, downloading apps on your smartphone, you know, uh, Android will unpack them so that, you know, uh, you know, they take less uh, data in transit. Um, other things like, um, you know, we've got HTML tests in there because, you know, people spend so much time in their web browsers today. That's an important uh, metric to capture. Other things that came out of the pandemic, um, things like video conferencing, you know, we have a background blur workload because sort of doing that zoom effect of where your face is visible but your background's not, you know, if you've got, you know, a messy, you know, if you're working from home and you're working out of your bedroom or something like that, you know, you don't necessarily want people to see. Uh, and that suddenly become a, a new workload that, you know, wasn't even relevant three, four years ago. It's just sort of something that just came out of, you know, the the uh, the pandemic that happened. Because we really don't want Geekbench to exist in a vacuum. We just don't want it to be a benchmark that says, oh, this new process 
processor is better, this new processor is worse. Uh, we want it to be representative of what people actually do. So when people turn to Geekbench, they look at our charts, they look at the articles that are written using our benchmark, they're actually able to make good decisions about, is it time to upgrade? Is my device working properly? I did get quite a few comments on my YouTube videos where I featured Geekbench when uh, a device doesn't win and someone wants it to win. They say, oh, that's because Geekbench is better optimized for, for the other device. That's not true, is it? You optimize equally for, for everything, don't you? Absolutely. We spend a lot of time, we work with hardware companies as well. Uh, so the hardware companies that, you know, maybe are the ones who authored or implement the uh, inst uh, instruction set that we're using. We work with them as well to make sure that what we've got is um, not necessarily the very, very best that it can be, but that it's a fair and representative sampling of what that instruction set usage might be. Uh, and uh, we try and do that with all the various instruction sets that we support. So whether it's on the ARM side, whether it's on the uh, x86 side, uh, we try and make sure one that, you know, if it's something that we've written that, you know, it's uh, it, it's fair, it's reasonable, that it, it works well across all, because we really don't want to be in a position where we're writing, um, you know, let's say, uh, as an example, let's say we've gone and we've written a neon version of an uh, of a function, we don't want to necessarily take that neon version and try and graft it onto an SSE version, you know, sort of write SSE in the way of neon, we try and write things in a way that's natural for the instruction set that leverages the advantages, uh, and is mindful of the disadvantages of that instruction set so that we get something that should be comparable uh, across both platforms or both across both instruction sets. And it definitely is uh, it is a tricky job. We do definitely, we have a lot of our development processes sort of dedicated around making sure that these sort of differences, if they creep up, we can catch them and sort of see, you know, uh, we, you know, we're constantly comparing. We have a lab here of, you know, over 150 different test devices. Uh, we've had one hardware company refer to our lab as the hardware computing museum, because we've got things that go all the way back, uh, from on the PC side, you know, a core two duo all the way up to Raptor Lake systems. Uh, so, you know, we try and capture the whole breadth of things so that we, we were constantly looking to see, you know, okay, well, this only supports SSE. Is our SSE version working well? Okay, this only supports, you know, we've got IB Bridge or something like that. It only supports AVX. Is our AVX version working well? Okay, what about AVX2? So we're constantly doing that testing to make sure that, you know, in the development process, we haven't missed anything, that the results make sense, that they seem sensible, and that we haven't introduced any of that sort of bias that might come, especially once we start getting to the point of, you know, when we're handwriting, uh, AVX2 code or uh, neon code, you know, that sort of you know in, uh, unconscious bias that on you know that you know, one one code path might better be suited for an architecture than another. We really try and avoid that, and we really dedicate a lot of time to making sure that, that doesn't happen. I think a video tour of that lab would be quite interesting. <laughs> that would be really it, it would be if we had a chance to clean it up. The uh, oh, yeah. uh, the, the <laughs> comment I've said <laughs> is exactly it's it's a little bit chaotic now. I <laughs> joked that you know we just moved into we tripled our office size uh, at the uh, beginning of 2020, right before the pandemic, oh. and then everybody worked from home, which has been great because it means that basically every desk we have in the office is covered with something leading up into the uh, the release of Geekbench six. So no, we're hoping to do something soon about you know just showing people like this is what the, the our lab looks like this is how we develop geekbench because i think a lot of people i think would assuage a lot of those fears that people have about sort of oh it's this black box that just you know who knows what goes into it no actually here's what you go into it here's how you know seriously we take the cross-platform aspect of this benchmark uh and just the work that it entails okay please do tell me a bit about geekbench 6 Sure. So Geekbench 6 um, is sort of the evolution of sort of Geekbench as what we're looking at, as I said, you know, really trying to develop a real world uh, benchmark that measures the performance of the CPU. And now, of course, you know, for the last couple of versions as well, the GPU, when it comes to sort of compute tasks, the, the sort of things that we say, you know, what are what are users using in their applications? Um, you know, uh, things like web browsers, photo applications, uh, whether it's, you know, organization, whether it's, you um, uh, filters that you might put on social media, uh, those sorts of things that people are doing day in, day out uh, with their applications. So with Geekbench 6, what we've done is we've really tried to, um, you know, further improve uh, the real world relevance of the uh, of the uh, benchmark. So uh, whether it's a case of, you know, uh, going through and sort of figuring out, you know, what people are doing with their computers today, hence the addition of workloads like background blur to sort of model the sorts of things that, you know, we saw over the pandemic. Um, yeah, other things like, uh, you know, how are people using ML, uh, to, you know, uh, organize their lives in a certain way, you know, the photo library workload that I mentioned earlier, where, you know, uh, applications will tag your photos automatically for you. So you don't have to do that. Um, and as I said, you know, as somebody with young children, it's helpful because there are some days where, you know, it feels like I've taken a hundred pictures and I don't have time to sit down and, and sort through them. Um, other workloads that we've done as well, um, are things like, uh, 
you know, uh, improving uh, the data sets that we're using uh, for some of the other workloads. You know, there are workloads that, you know, are evolutions of workloads that were in Geekbench 5, but now they're working on larger data sets. You know, and a really obvious example of that is in mobile devices. If you look at what a flagship phone had for a camera sensor in 2019 when Geekbench 5 came out versus 2023 today, you know, we're seeing some cameras with 48 megapixels, 108 megapixel cameras. You know, it's just been this explosion in image size. Uh, and applications have to deal with that. So, you know, we're trying to answer questions like, you know, how do applications, how do your, how does your processor, how does your phone deal with, you know, a 48 megapixel image that your camera might be generating? You might be taking every single time, you know, you take a picture. So, you know, trying to make the data sets bigger, trying to make the workload, the work that the workloads are doing are more relevant, more realistic. That was the big push for what we did in uh, Geekbench 6. One other thing that we did as well again, trying to look at the relevance is we've completely changed the way that we do threading uh, in Geekbench 6. So if if you're not familiar with Geekbench 5, you know, we've always, we've split out the scores into a single core score and a multi-core score. In Geekbench 6, uh, we still have the same single core and multi-core score, but we've changed the way that we actually do the parallelism inside Geekbench to get that multi-core score. In Geekbench 5, what we do is we'd have, uh, we'd look at the number of cores on a system. So let's say you're on a smartphone and you've got eight cores. We'd launch eight separate tasks. Uh, and that's a great way to sort of measure sort of, you know, a best case scenario for multi-threading. You know, each core can kind of do its own thing. It doesn't have to communicate with the other cores. You know, it's kind of incumbent on the scheduler to move stuff around if, you know, one core is idle or something like that. But for the most part, the core is kind of left on their own. They complete the tasks. It's kind of the best case scenario for threading. And what we've done in Geekbench is we think that sort of models a little bit optimistic because applications as core counts increase more on the desktop than mobile, but as core counts increase, applications have to be rewritten and reworked to take advantage of those cores. And not all algorithms are going to be able to do that. Not all of your processes are going to be able to do that. Some things are still inherently single threaded. Some things you can parallelize a little bit. Some things you can parallelize a lot. So that's what we've tried to do with the new multi-core suite in Geekbench 6 is split things out into those workloads where some of them parallelize really well, some of them you get a little bit of parallelism, some you just don't get much at all. Uh, and so instead of having that separate copy of a task on each of the cores, the cores instead all work on one shared task, uh, which we think is a much more representative way of, you know, if you've got a foreground application, you know, you're applying filters to a photo, you're trying to do that sort of stuff. Um, it's a much more realistic way because now the threads have to coordinate with one another. They have to communicate back and forth. And it really puts a lot more stress on the operating system, on the uh, CPU design to make sure the uh, communication between those cores is efficient uh, and that, you know, the cores are able to work together as quickly as possible to actually accomplish a task. Uh, so that was the other really big thing that we've done in Geekbench 6 to sort of improve the real world relevance of the workloads. So the scores between, let's say, Geekbench 5 and Geekbench 6 are not directly uh, comparable because they are different uh, benchmarks. However, when it comes to the point releases, let's say Geekbench 5, Geekbench 5.1, Geekbench 5.2, can you compare the results across these different point releases? Once we get, so usually with a, with what we've done in the past, you know, uh, 3.0 wasn't necessarily comparable with 3.1, 4.0 wasn't comparable with 4.1, because usually there's always, you know, as much as, you know, especially now, you know, we, we have a very large testing lab, so we're able to catch a lot of issues before the release, uh, but there is always going to be feedback that we're going to get uh, after we ship a benchmark and someone's going to point something out and we go, oops, that, that we, we, we made a mistake there, we should fix that. And we always try and do that in the first month or two. So, you know, uh, you know, 6.0 to 6.1, will it be compared? It's hard to say. Um, but after that point, we really try and keep the benchmark comparable for the 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. Usually when we do a dot two, a dot three release, it's sort of a, oh, we're adding support for new hardware. So if you're benchmarking that new hardware, you might want to just use the newer version. Otherwise, it's comparable to the older scores because those systems weren't out at the time that, you know, say dot one or dot zero was out. So for the most part, it's comparable. Um, we try and call out explicitly where it is or isn't comparable in our release notes, because that turns out to be a very common question that we get uh, just from our users. So you know, we're trying to be more proactive about making that clear. Uh, thank you for chatting me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we close, I want to remind you, you can follow me on social media. All the handles are here on the screen. And I also have a monthly newsletter. Go over to GaryExplains.com, type in your email address, no spam, but you will get the newsletter. Okay, so I'd like to again thank John for spending the time chatting to me. If you enjoyed this video, do please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. That's it. I'll see you in the next one.